if you have questions, feel free to um, shout them out and we'll do our best to cover everything. If not, you'll have our contact information and we'll go that direction. So anyway, raising replacement females is all about a partnership. And so the female, whether it's a doe, a you, that heifer, you're expecting them to produce a live baby every year. That's their job. You know, they're going to give you some way to make money. And you want them to do it on a regular basis. With our cows, we want them to calf about the same time every year so we can count on that paycheck. The same thing with your sheep or your goats. You want them to kid at the same time every year because that's how you're structuring your income. Um, and it needs to be alive, <laughs> you know? Dead calves, dead lambs don't do you any good. And it's much easier if they can do it without any assistance from you. One year when my husband and I were calving, you knew we had a wreck. My birthday's the last of February. I got a calf puller for my birthday. Does that tell you how our calving season was going? <laughs> it wasn't going well. There was a lot of assistance going on. And then we want that female to take care of that young and be able to wean it so we have a product to sell. So that's their part. Our part is to provide the nutrition basis that they need so they can do all of that. Um, we need to meet their nutritional requirements. We need to have work with our vet and have a health plan. And what's that pre-vaccination program look like? What's that look like? That's our responsibility. And then anytime we make management decisions versus a pasture, trying a new feed, changing a supplement, putting in new water, we need to keep our herd in mind so that we're making the best, best management decisions that's going to make them be positive and productive as part of our operation. So here's your first Slido question. And if everybody online, um, if you go to slido.com and then type in the code 807416, this question will pop up. And then you can answer the question. And as people answer, it should show up here. It worked when I did it with CSI students earlier this week. <laughs> So the question, I'll let you talk about, Melinda, this is your question. Oh, <laughs> uh, the question is what your current management is as far as nutrition. And um, we're primarily looking for, are you, are you balancing rations for your animals? And if so, are you keeping your replacement animals with or separate from your mature animals? So that's what this question is. So we can see how many we got. That's why it's so This French background is so so it looks like most of the people are balancing a diet. Yeah. That's pretty, that's impressive. Right. Yeah, it doesn't happen very often, to be honest. And it's complex math and I understand why it doesn't happen, but it's something that we're gonna discuss is a pretty important piece of making sure your animals get a nutritional diet that they can work with. So. But I'm glad to see a lot of us are separating our replacements from our. Okay, so I'm not. Mature animals. Why is it not advancing now? Come on. Well, advance on this one. Mm -mm, that's just a. That's. I don't know how to. There we oh, go. There you go. Okay. Sometimes it's just the right key. 
So as we look at a job description for your replacement females, we want to reach puberty early, early, at least on the beef end of things. The earlier that heifer reaches puberty, the longer she's going to stay in the herd. The more productive she is and she becomes productive at an earlier date. Breed during a synchronized breeding system or a natural breed when you're turning in your ram in, when you're turning your bull in, are they catching on those first couple of things? Jump in here anytime. Yep, same so. deal. <laughs> if, we're, if we're having our young ULMs and doelings reaching puberty earlier and we turn in our ram and we can catch them on the first or second heat cycle, then they're going to save you a lot of time for one because they'll ram when you want them to, <laughs> but also stay in the, in the pot longer. Again, back to that healthy young um, without assistance. That means we get a good night's sleep. We don't have lambs or calves on the back porch or in the bathtub. I've had them in the bathtub at my house. Um, we want them to rebreed that first cycle um, so that they um, reproduce at the same time every year. And then all at the lowest cost. Every time we have to call Dr. Sarah, that animal costs us more money. And nothing against Dr. Sarah, she's doing her job, but you know, she likes to sleep at night too. So having to be called to pull, do a C-section, rescue something. So there's five required nutrients that we're gonna talk about. Protein, energy, minerals, our vitamins, and then water. So here's another Slido question. What do you feel is the most important protein, energy, mineral, vitamins, or water? So this one, you're just gonna type in the answer. We're gonna create a word cloud. And the more people that type in one word, the bigger it'll be and we'll realize that they think it's the most important thing. Right now, water's the winner. Well, that's actually pretty obvious. <laughs> I couldn't get it anyway, so I'm going to check it out. So it looks like a lot of people consider, consider water extremely important. And then next is protein and then the minerals. I'll let you do this one. Okay, so every animal has a different nutrient requirement based on um, where they're at in their life, how old they are, what's going on. And so when you take your herd as a whole, you're gonna try to take an average so you get a good idea. We might be high on our lower requirement animals and low on our higher requirement animals. In theory, you're going to hit them all with what they need if you take the average, right? But there's also going to be a lot of times where um, the age of the animal, we all have those ancient user cows that just always look a little bit dumpy, even though they raise a nice big calf. And sometimes you might need to give them a little bit extra to keep them going. We all have those. Um, and you don't like to get rid of them because they're a good mama but they need a little extra when they get older, right? So age, when they're younger, since we're talking replacement females, the replacement females are gonna need a lot of extra because they're growing at the same time as they're doing all these other things that we're expecting of our mature animals. And so if the animals are just out there, no lamb, calf, kid on them, that's what we call maintenance. And so if we're just hanging out, we're at a mature mid-age, not having to do a whole lot, that's when you're targeting that maintenance diet. And then of course, when we add any other thing to them, they're gonna need to jump those requirements to meet those needs. And so um, in particular, when we look at small ruminants, the place that we see the most jump is when those animals are carrying more than one offspring. Um, it just adds and adds and adds. And at the end of the day, we have you know three lambs on board, and we might have double or triple what the single lamb mamas are gonna need. So um, just some considerations. The other things to consider is, you know, the altitude that we're at, the climate that we're in, the time of year that it is. Um, I think a lot of times we forget when it's 10 below that we might need to dump a little extra out for them because it's cold and they need to overcome that as well. 
Um, also, any sort of parasitism that's happening can really affect how much they're getting from the nutrients you give them. And so that's another consideration. If you've got something with some dairy background, they produce so much more milk that you're going to need to feed them more. My husband and I got a good deal on some Angus Holstein cross heifers. And they did good the first year. Oh my word, we had some outstanding calves. But um, the forage in the summer in central Utah and high mountains wasn't enough to get them bred back because they put it, dumped it all into milk and they just had more milk than we really had forage for. If I have a sheep, prod, sheep picture, it can be yours. <laughs> <laughs> so when I think about balancing a ration, the two, there's two things that I think of as top priority as far as making sure that we're meeting the needs. And one of them is protein. The other is energy, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but protein is really important, especially when you're growing an offspring in you. <laughs> protein is the building block of all the growth that's happening. And so you have to make sure that as we start getting bigger and bigger babies, as we get into later gestation, that we're bumping our protein, um, what we're offering in as, as protein up so that they are able to accommodate the growth of that fetus. Additionally, when we get really close to the end of um, gestation and we're getting ready to have those offspring, we have to start making milk and milk requires a lot of protein as well. And so this is why as we go through, you're gonna see the requirements bump up as we get later into gestation. The other thing that's super important, especially with your replacement animals, is that when you're looking at the protein levels that they need to raise offspring, you have to add that much more because they're also still growing. So there's a huge bump there. If they're not getting enough protein, you're gonna see um, animals that kind of get skinnier, obviously, but it's depression from not able to maintain that muscle, not able to um, maintain that offspring. You may end up with some abortions that you were not expecting. And so those are the really severe things that can happen, but it's not always easy to tell when you're protein deficient if you're not making sure what you're giving them has the protein that they need. So in uh, protein, we express it as crude protein when we look at rations. So if you see crude protein, that's just the amount of protein in a substance that is available to the animal. So protein, as Melinda mentioned, is very necessary for your maintenance. You have your maintenance requirements, such as your heartbeat, your brain activity, respiration, and any vital functions. Um, a lot of growth enlargement of the cells, the bones, muscle, fat, organ. It helps with a healthy immune system. Again, we have a better immune system on our calves, the less we have to call Dr. Sarah. Um, lactation, that important production of milk and then reproduction, and then your gestation, the development of the placenta and the fetal growth. So just to give you an idea of looking at heifers and cows, as you can see with the heifer, 600 pound heifer, you're looking at one and a half pounds. And then as she gets older, her protein requirements are going up. And when you can look at the lactating heifer and the lactating cow, you can see that bump because as Melinda mentioned, those heifers, those young animals are still growing. So you have to accommodate for that also. So energy is one. Um, a lot of people will say, well, I'm feeding good alfalfa hay. I got everything covered. Not all of our alfalfa hay has the energy that's necessary. And so that's something we wanna look at. When you look at energy, actually it's the potential to perform work. And it's all those body functions that that animal needs to stay alive. Um, plus growth, lactation and reproduction. How much energy they need, it comes back to the same reasons. It's dependent on what they need for protein. How old are they? What stage of production are they at? How fast are you wanting them to grow? And what's the environment? Is it 100 degrees or is it minus 20? <laughs> How much um, energy is it taking to stay warm? So there's a couple of things. If you get a feed analysis done, there's the gross energy, which is the amount of energy released from that feed when they burn it, when heat's applied to it. Then you'll have a digestible energy, which is your gross energy, minus all the energy that they would lose when every time they... Um, in the feces, 
And then you'll have a total digestible nutrients, which is a TDN, which is a pretty good mix of everything to look at. Um, but it takes into account that you do get some energy from protein. And then you have a metabolizable energy, which is the digestible energy minus the energy lost in the urine and the gases. And then your net energy is the metabolized minus the energy lost in digestion. So when you're looking at a feed label or a nutrition, if you send feed off, really take and hone in and look and see what that TDN is. Yeah, that's, there's a lot built into all these different types of energies and I know it's overwhelming. So the one that I focus the most on when I'm balancing a ration is the TDN, total digestible nutrients, because that gives you an idea of what they're actually consuming and able to use for energy. So that's, that's the one that I focus my attention on. Although some feed analysis don't have TDN, as an option, which makes it kind of frustrating. Think of some of the other energies as the wrappers around that are holding the TD in the middle. And so you're really wanting to get to the inside. This is just a kind of a schematic um, of energy. You have your X, your that you have your vital functions. And then if you have something left over, it's going to go to lactation. If you have some energy left over, it's going to go into reproduction. And if you have still some energy left over in your feet, it's going to go into storage in the form of fat. <laughs> So again, this is just another chart looking, comparing heifers and mature cows at different um, stages in their life. As you see that heifer, lact lactating heifer and that yearling heifer have the highest energy requirements versus your cow, which comes back to feeding appropriate age groups and feeding them appropriately. Um, I'm not gonna eat this. I should, probably shouldn't eat the same amount as the Cerise girls in the front row because my metabolism slowed down a little bit. <laughs> so <laughs> when we talk about vitamins and minerals, um, we're not gonna get into the nitty gritty because there's a billion things that can go wrong if these are imbalanced. And so this is where I think it's really important to consider working with a nutritionist of some kind to get what you specifically need on your operation because it has to do with what you're feeding, what's in the soil, what's in the water. All these things roll into it and it's the most complicated part, but it's also the most important part when it comes to making sure that you don't have random things that are happening with your animals. It's really hard to know what's going on. Um, but almost every one of these minerals has something to do with your normal um, cellular function, growth being able to um, put on fat deposition, um, hair, bones, teeth, and, and feet, all of these things are really important. And the most common time for these things to present is around lambing, calving, and kidding time, because if they are not balanced in the way that they should be, you get a lot of weird deformities or weak offspring coming out. And I could talk for an hour about that by itself. And so if you guys want to get into that weed, uh, those weeds, I'm happy to do that with you. But um, today, we don't have enough time. But I would recommend uh, making sure that you have a good mineral program in your herd because it's really important for all of those things, including um, coming in, and especially for the growing animals. If you really want to know how well your mineral program's working, send off a liver biopsy. And you can have an analysis of that. And I'll tell you a lot about what your mineral program is doing. So as you look at your minerals, you want to know what your soils are like. In Lemhi County, at least for cattle, we've got to feed extra copper. And it's not because we're short of copper in the soil. We have enough molybdenum that it ties up the copper. And so knowing that, helps you figure out, work with a nutritionist of what you may need to make a special mix. When Lemhi Feed and Fertilizer was in business, they had the Lemhi mix that everybody fed that had the higher amounts of copper so that the cattle have it. You can see a copper deficiency in our Black Angus cattle if they have just a little bit of red tint to the hair every once in a while. So um, analysis of a feed, including your minerals, is money well spent. 25 to 30 bucks, depending on what test you wanna run. And then if you're using supplement tubs to get that, monitor. If the salesman says this tub should last you 10 days, 
go out and see if it really did last 10 days or if there's still half left and they may need to remix so that they're eating the proper amount. Okay, so for which of the following do you feel your current feeding program is meeting the requirements? And you can choose more than one. Okay. Yeah, it was got pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go to sleep. I guess we should explain what fill is before we get too far. So <laughs> fill would be the amount that the animals eat to where they feel full. So there's times where, for example, if you have a really high protein feed and you're only feeding a certain amount of it, they're getting what they need, but they might not feel like they're full and vice versa. They might feel full, but they're not actually getting the nutrients that they need. So I apologize, that's what that is. <laughs> we haven't covered that yet. Sorry. <laughs> Looks like everybody's pretty confident they're meeting their protein needs. Yeah. That's awesome. So I would say that um, just from the experience I've had working with different producers um, in cattle, in late gestation, it typically is a protein limited situation where maybe they're not quite meeting their protein. Um, ruminant animals have a really good way of turning fiber, fibrous feeds into energy. And so most of the time throughout their life cycle, they are able to take, you know, grass that's out there on the ground right now and turn it into something they can use for energy. And um, it's really when you start getting into the smaller ruminants that have two or three offspring on board that we start to have energy be our limiting factor. And so this isn't always true, but that just is what my experience we run into the most compared to the different species. So it's good if you guys know your protein is <laughs> okay. So water um, is the most essential uh, nutrient. So everybody can put water, good job. Um, because without it, none of the other things matter, right? And the biggest thing to consider is that, especially with um, your gestating and lactating animals, it's really important to make sure they're receiving extra water, free choice, they have what they need, um, because they can't make milk without water. <laughs> so that's one of them. Um, and then, of course, water plays into every other function that happens in the animal's body. So. Um, making sure that they have access to clean, um, fresh water. Uh, so much, we have a list here of all the amounts that each animal needs. And so the idea here would be, you know, if you've got uh, sheep and goats, mature animals can drink up to five gallons. So make sure there's five gallons per animal available at all times. Um, same goes with the cow. Um, in cold weather, she might only drink a gallon, but that's a gallon per 100 pounds but that's still quite a bit of water in the course of a day. And so just making sure that it's, you know, de-iced and clean and fresh and available. And the interesting thing about livestock, if you can, running water is something that they prefer. So if you can give them a running water source, they're gonna be more inclined to drink it. And in the really, really cold months, if it's a little bit warmer than your air temperature, they're also gonna be more inclined and vice versa in the hot months. That's one of the things I noticed. My horses will drink a lot more in the winter if I do a lot of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they don't push <laughs> <laughs> Um. So this is one thing I wanted to point out because if you send your feed off for a feed analysis, which we're going to just keep pressuring you to do because it's really important to make sure you know what you have with each one of your feeds to be able to make sure your animals are meeting requirements, right? So 
when you get a feed analysis back, everything is going to be um, on a dry matter basis, which essentially means that we're taking the water out of the feed. So because water makes up everything to some degree, what we're doing is we send off those feeds and you can go ahead and click the, we send off those feeds and we get um, them put in a, in a dryer and they'll take a value right out of the dryer. Any nutrient that's in that feed is not also in the water. So that's why they do that. So we take the water out to make all of the feeds calibrated at the same level. For example, most hay is gonna run about 90% dry matter. So every value that you take, you're gonna do it on a dry matter basis. But what that means is when you feed the hay, you're gonna have to feed a little bit more to make up for that 10% water. Does that make sense? So you need to calculate it as a dry feed, but then make sure you add the water back in when you feed it. So we'll get into that a little bit more. <laughs> so anyway, you know, as we're talking about feeds and looking at trying to get a heifer to a productive cow, this just kind of gives you some ideas of where they need to be and weight wise, looking at a, a mature of a 1200 pound cow, when she's at pre-breeding, you want her at 60 to 65%. If your mature cows are bigger or smaller than that, you need to adjust these weights, but these percentages will stay fairly solid. Because again, you're trying to get her to growth, you're trying to get puberty, she's um, developing that reproductive system. And so with that first preg check, 70 to 75% of her mature weight, the first calf, second calf, remember, she's still growing. She's not done yet. So you're not only feeding her growth, a calf growth, she's calving. You're asking that uterus to repair so she breeds back. Again, as you look at those, um, those cattle females, um, you always want them to cycle first, 30 to 45 days. If they can have three key cycles and breed on that third one, they have a higher conception rate. And again, they'll eat about 2.3 to two and a half of their body weight and dry matter as you're calculating how much hay you need. So when we talk about how much we should feed, this is that fill side of things, right? We need to make sure we're feeding them enough to make them feel satisfied. And so this chart at the top for uh, the sheep and goats, the top is 160 pound mature ewe, and then down here we have a yearling ewe lamb, and the same is going to apply to goats at the same weight. Um, but we're targeting this 160 pound ewe. And so when we look across this top, we can see what size these animals need to be at this stage. And so you think about it's pretty similar um, if we're hitting 65 to 70% of the mature body size when we breed them for the first time. And then as we get a little bit older, we're growing, of course. And um, so these animals should be hitting their mature size by about a year and a half old. And as you can see, when we are feeding um, during these different stages, so we have a maintenance diet here, a mature ewe is only gonna need 2.8 pounds where a yearling ewe lamb will eat 3.6 pounds. So you can see the adjustment just based on the fact that she's still growing and needs to get that extra um, to keep going. So this is pounds of what, hay or supplements? Or uh, this is just pounds of feed as a total. So um, when we go to balance the ration, say I'm gonna balance um, this four pound ration and I'm gonna put two pounds of hay, grass hay, and two pounds of alfalfa hay, and you want to meet the four pounds total. So that's the fill of the animal. And um, these are just single lambs, and we'll get into a little bit more about how much more we increase for twins and triplets as well. So this is a um, similar thing, just looking at developing those heifers. Um, I held it at a pound for daily gain, just for simplicity, all the way across. So we were comparing apples and apples until you get to that 950 pound heifer that's nursing a calf. As you can see, they're growing. So they're eating more all the time. Their protein requirements are climbing, both in the pounds and the percentage as you look at your feeds, and then the amount of TDN that they're needing. Um, again, because you're asking them to grow, calve, produce milk, repair, and 
have the next calf ready to go. And so it's a moving target all the time because just because you start with X at one time, you're not gonna stay with X all the way through. You're gonna have to do X, Y, Z and keep them on that growing stage. And if they get a little bit thin, you're gonna do it. If you happen to have something that's lush pasture and they're a little porky or um, how would one of my CSI students put the other day, fat and happy, you might back them down just a little bit because you're wasting because they're putting on that fat. So similar to what Shannon just described for your heifers, these are going to be mature animals. And just remember that we have to add more for the um, growing aspect of the replacements. But this is going through um, early gestation, late gestation, and early lactation for small ruminants. And this is for uh, the mature ewes on this one. And I've got it set up here where if, if there's a space, it means one lamb versus three lambs, and obviously 10 would fall in between somewhere. And so um, you can see that sheep have this really interesting way of needing a lot more nutrients when it comes to lambing time. And so when we're uh, just in early gestation and maintenance, we're pretty similar actually to what the cattle are needing as far as protein around 8%. And then the TDN, remember, is total digestible nutrients, and that's a function that we look at for energy. So 53% of your diet should be um, digestible. And then as they get later into gestation and more towards lactation, if they are um, raising triplets, you can see when they're lactating, they need upwards of 16%, in some cases, protein. And so we really see it jump. And this is, I mean, it's double. So when we're making sure we get close, whether it's cattle, sheep, goats, whatever, as we get closer to gestation and hitting that lactation point, you really got to bump them. Because otherwise, we're going to talk about some of the things that can go wrong, but it can be bad. So um, the same chart on the next slide for goats. And I put these in here, um, anybody who's raising sheep, I don't know if you handed this out or not, but we can uh, yeah, see these tables to help you work through some of those. And so if we have a ewe lamb, for example, that's having triplets and she's still growing, you can imagine the amount of feed that we really need to be dumping for her because if she needs 16% as a mature ewe, she's probably looking more like 20% to keep growing and have babies. Um, so this chart, is demonstrating how Phil, when the animal feels full, she does not necessarily get what she needs. And so um, we have this um, 160 pound mature you again, and go ahead and click. I'm just gonna use an example of a medium quality hay, which would be a brown hay at about 10% protein and 55% uh, TDN. And if you uh, look back on the chart, to what the requirements are. Um, on the last chart, we don't have to go back, but basically a brown hay is gonna meet your requirements during maintenance or early, early gestation because we have enough protein and we have enough energy going in. And remember, 91% dry matter, we have to calculate that extra 10% as just water, but it is in the feed we're feeding them. So just keep that in mind. So as we calculate, we look up and we see that during all these phases, we need to have four and a half, five pounds of feed. If we have triplets, we may need seven. And so if I'm gonna feed them five pounds a day, just on average, because I'm trying to accommodate everybody, remember 91% is dry matter and the other 9% is water. So what we're actually feeding is five and a half pounds. Does that make sense to you guys? I hope I'm not losing you. So this is the amount we're actually feeding. This is the amount we're taking to look at the protein and the energy in the feed. So then we calculate how many pounds of protein are we getting out of this feed if it's a 10% protein feed. So we're basically getting half a pound of protein out of that five pounds. And we're getting 2.75 pounds out of that five pounds. And so I think if you click, it'll show you, we're meeting our intake requirements. So they're feeling full, they're getting enough, they're happy, except for if they're having three 
lambs during lactation. And this applies to cattle too, the way that we calculate, it's just obviously much bigger numbers. <laughs> and what we're doing here is in late gestation, if we only have a single or a twin, these animals are meeting their protein and their energy requirements. But if you have three lambs or you're going into lactation, you're not meeting. And so at this point, go ahead. One more. Sorry. If we're only feeding an average over here of 4.4 4 pounds a day, because we are just taking the average of what we think our group is. We don't really know if we have triplets in the mix. We're just trying to target whatever we can do. And then all of a sudden, we're just not meeting any of our requirements. And this is how you end up with animals in your late gestation and early lactation start to fall off and get skinny. And one of the things that I like to point out when I talk about nutrition is if you are losing condition during pregnancy, and or lactation, you are not going to make it back up. So make sure that they are fed ahead of time because otherwise it's gonna cost you a fortune and you may not get there even if you do dump a fortune into them. And also keep in mind that these are requirements for mature ewes and we haven't even calculated in the growing portion of our replacements. So it's just really important. I'm happy to help every one of you individually if you would like to balance a ration and make sure that you're meeting requirements during these stages, especially when you're replacement animals, because they will have a hard time coming back from it if you don't. Okay. I think that's all I have on that slide. <laughs> so this is why we just wanted to emphasize the importance of separating your animals, replacements versus mature, because it's a lot easier if you have 150 pound views and 100 pound yearlings, it's going to be really hard for them to get what they need because those big mature ewes are going to be taking everything and these guys need more. So that's why we recommend, if at all possible, separate your, your replacements from your mature animals. And especially with the small ruminants, if they have different number of fetuses, if you can get that done uh, via ultrasound by your vet, it would really help to separate, especially those triplets out and help feed them a little bit more as well. So just in general, when you're feeding, you take the average of whatever group you're feeding and hope that they're getting what they need. But if you can condense it into a more consistent group of animals, then you're more guaranteed to get them what they need, if that makes sense. Okay. So when you're selecting your feeds and you're looking fees, especially if you've bought feeds this last year, just because it's bright green doesn't necessarily mean that it has the nutrition you need. It means that they got it harvested properly with time and not too mature and things like that. Um, and how mature that plant is, is going to have an effect on the nutrition inside of that plant. So, a, you know, a younger alfalfa that's pre-bloom is much higher than protein than an alfalfa plant that is at full bloom because that plant just put all of its all of its energy into bloom and root rather than holding it into there. So have a nutritional analysis done. It'll help you manage your haystack. It'll help you manage your feed. If you're buying grain haze, I really encourage you to have it tested for nitrates. Um, nitrates could poison. They cause death. There's no other way around it because the nitrates attach to the blood instead of the oxygen. And so they basically suffocate. And there's been some wrecks. Now, you can have different levels of nitrates in a feed that are safe to feed certain animals. At a certain level, you can feed it to anything. And the next level, you can feed it to anything that's open. And then if you go higher, you're going to have, you start losing pregnancies and having early term abortions, or at the final, final level, is death. So if you're buying grains or if you're raising grain haze, have it tested for nitrates. I can take a sample at my office and I can give you a pretty good idea if nitrates are there or not. And if they're there, I really encourage you to pay the 25 bucks, send it off, get it analyzed. Just don't say, hey, I want to test my hay for nitrates. And I'm going to say, when are you going to start feeding it? When you say tomorrow, I'm going to say, 
Okay. <laughs> I can do a quick and dirty, but I'm not going to give you a solid answer. You know, you might find a sacrificial animal that you don't like, maybe the one that ran over you and you want to get rid of her, put her in and see what she does with the nitrates. But this last year with all of the drought and stuff, if they fertilized fields, planted a grain hay, and then didn't get it watered all the way well, you could have some higher nitrates this year. So, Slido question, do you have your winter feeds analyzed for nutritional quality? Yes. <laughs> Good girl. <Whoever> said that. <laughs> and it may not be something that you have to do every year, but if you've got new property or a new seeding, it doesn't hurt to know where that feed is, especially if feed is tight. And like this field did really good. We got higher protein and higher energy. I'm going to stash that for my developing females and this older hay that's not quite where it needs to be. I'm going to feed to my bulls or I'm going to feed to my mature cows. And I have a hay core that you can come borrow and take samples. You can send samples in yourself. Um, it's, it's really quick and simple. It takes about max 10 days once you bring a sample to my office and we get it mailed off. I encourage you to bring samples in on Mondays or Tuesdays because then they get right to the lab and they're not ship sitting on some shipping dock over the weekend to get stuff back. And I help people use the information to balance with rations all the time. I'd be more than happy to do it for you. Um, it doesn't take me long at all, and I can do any of the species. So <laughs> hit <Yeah>. me up. <laughs> we'll get it done. Just we'll make sure you're good. How much of a sample do you need to Um, I usually, so a lot depends on if the more samples you take, the quarters are one inch cores. And um, it's an actually a bracing bit that you drill in. And so the more samples you take, the more representative it's going to be of your haystack. But we need a, probably about a cup to a half a cup of hay. And so you'll want to go take those samples, mix them up in a plastic bucket. Don't use a metal bucket, it will screw with your sample. Mix it up with a plastic bucket, bring it to us in a Ziploc sack, Label it with so you know that it came out of, I'm going to pick on Tori, the Pissimera hay I bought versus hay I got out of Mud Lake so that you know which stack it is. If you just go out and take all your cores out at the same, or I've had them bring in samples from the field and they've just walked through and I'm not sure how far they walk across the field to pull samples. The fewer samples, it's just going to be represent those, that hay that you took right there. So, and I would recommend, I think the rule of thumb is uh, sample 20% of the hay in the stack. And you want to have a separate sample for each stack or each source or wherever, just to make sure that you're understanding it. And Shannon's right, you don't have to do it every year, but your hay every year will vary within five to 10% crude protein. So that can, that can influence how much alfalfa you have to buy. If your hay is 12% versus 8%, you're gonna feed a lot more alfalfa at the 8% grass hay than you would at 12%. So for me, I do it every year and I get my hay from the same place every year and it varies enough that it makes a difference for me. And like Shannon said, they're 25 bucks to get all this information and we can do a really nice job and we can even get to the minerals, which I didn't talk a lot about, but I said how important they are and it is, something that we can do, so. Yeah. If you're wanting, you know, you can always feed my on the forest with your heifers. Um, that'll help with some gains. That's your rumensin or your bovatac. There's some studies that those heifers that had 200 grams um, reached puberty early. Um, and that also decreases the interval to the first postpartum estrus.
Um, so as far as rations on pasture, I know we're not really on pasture right now, except maybe some winter grazing. Still important to know what's out there, um, particularly if you're grazing this time of year, because these feeds are probably not very high in protein or energy. Um, and so we can provide some supplements. I would recommend um, in, the, in the summer, it's a good idea to have a good feel for what quality your forages are all the time. But summer is probably a little less important than fall and winter, just because we're doing stockpile feeds or we're grazing, you know, whatever's out there right now. Um, but we could certainly help you with any of these options. So, um, so if you're in a position where you're gonna suddenly start adding alfalfa or grain of some kind to your feed. It's important to add it kind of slowly into their diet because especially with grains, they can get acidosis and it can ultimately kill them. Um, but basically it just builds up that acid in the rumen because the way that they digest in their rumen up with the grain produces lactic acid and so it can be a problem. So, Grass A to alfalfa, less of a big change, but still important to do it kind of slowly to get their guts adapted. And typically, if you're changing just one hay to another hay, you can go over a couple of weeks, just add it in slowly and more and more over time. Um, if you're doing grain, I would recommend at least three weeks before you get to the full amount that you're going to give them. Um, that just helps you not have to deal with bloats and <laughs> because remember, so, not only are you feeding the animal, you're feeding the bugs in that room. And, and those bugs are pretty specific and know what they like. And so when you send them something that they don't like, they get upset. So I had a couple of quick ones that I wanted to mention. And while this is more uh, specific, this specific one is more uh, for small ruminants, it still can happen in your cattle, especially if you're just really underfeeding them. But basically, pregnancy toxemia is a form of ketosis that happens in late gestation usually. And what happens is that fetus or fetuses um, pull a lot of glucose in that late stage. So they want 30 to 40 grams of sheep. Um, I don't know what it is for cattle, but, <laughs> um, but basically 60 to 70% of all the maternal glucose that's produced goes to the fetus. So if you are not feeding her at a level where she's able to make that glucose, then she's going to end up um, going into ketosis basically. And she's mobilizing from her fat stores. So when this is the most common, when animals are really, really skinny and they're not able to provide nutrients to the fetus, in animals that are really fat because <laughs> they have more fat than glucose. And so they're mobilizing this fat and the fetus cannot pull the ketones that come from that fat for energy. So basically, Everything just gets out of whack. She goes down. She has that sweet, catotic smell on her. And you have to intervene. And so this is why, especially with those multiple lamb and kids in the small room, and it's especially, it's important to make sure that they're just receiving what they need because then you don't have to deal with stuff like this. Um, it's the most common, like I said, with triplets or more. And also, if you have young females that are still growing and you're just not providing them enough to get through all this stuff, then it becomes this kind of issue. And you can intervene. I've had a case that worked out in my favor and I had one that did not. So it doesn't always, they basically go down and they're too weak to get up. And sometimes you have to induce labor and C-section and the whole mess. So that's why I'm picky about eating my sheep. <laughs> I've had it happen and it's not fun. The other one to consider, and this is more of a mineral problem, um, is those blood calcium levels. So they get milk fever. This happens in all of our ruminant species. Um, so this is one example of why the minerals are so, so important. And I could give you 50 more reasons why they're so, so important. Um, but this is a big one. And it has to do with the feeds when you're giving them a cereal hay or a low quality forage or something that just doesn't have that calcium in it. This can be a nutritional problem from um, more of a, a mineral standpoint, but still a problem. And so the low quality forages is the reason I put this one up here though, because you're also probably not meeting 
protein and energy at the same time. But with milk fever, they have this cool thing out now where if you cover their eye and you put a flashlight after 30 seconds, the amount of restriction tells you if it's hypoplasemia or not, which is really interesting to me. I just learned about this about six months ago, but um, it has to do with that calcium is so important in muscle function that the eye can't constrict as fast because there's not enough calcium for it to do so. So I thought that was really interesting and an easy way to figure out if that's what it is. Because as you know, it looks a lot like um, uh, nitrate tetany, grass tetany. Grass tetany. So anyway, that's all we have for you.